decision making. So, yeah, but you got a great beard. So, I mean, bribe, yeah, but I have no decision making power, so that's just a gift. that Dante she will when she dumps you again I want to laugh at you right in your face just so you realize that that was what you gave up our relationship for I'm just glad that Randall had the balls to tell me since you couldn't Randall and having him tell me that was just the weakest move ever you're spineless I'm Veronica, I love you! Okay, she's a shitty wizard! Yeah. She's a shitty wizard! Yeah. Has the set! Oh, she's got her in the headlines! Oh, I don't know why you're wrestling with it! But this is intense, everybody! This is the kind of action we give you on DIYCW, everybody! Last minute little jingle And if you feel that it is worse What's it to you? At least it's something to do of Vengeance for the Sega Genesis by EA and Beam Software, later known as Chrome Studios Melbourne, may they rest in peace, released in 1993. And if he's watching this, Matt Lister from Dover, New Hampshire, this is for you. Not only am I dedicating this to the aforementioned Lister, not to mention his lovely wife Becky Brooks, but also to Brooklyn Interactive Group and Somerville Media Center first and foremost, or secondly in this case, Deirdre Fisher from Welford, South Carolina, Sam Mulligan, Sidestep Complex made up of Danny and Liz, Mike Tendo Levy, Michael B. The Game Genie, Misguided Media LLC, Erica Shabo, Rinri, Shane Lewis from Rerez, and Wizwar 100, real name Al Snow Mock, from Canada, Manta Ray Vasquez from Connecticut, Dirk Alexander and Grace Kramer, care of Stop Skeletons from Fighting, 8-Bit Arc Perez from San Antonio, Texas, and Andrew Lowry and the DIY crew, including Justin Maloney, Penny Oswin from Penny for Your Thoughts, Not For Resales Kevin James, Bill Campbell from Insane Apricot, Jay Facepalm slash Destro Doherty, Trehart composed of Biff, Diamond Machine and Natural Logic, Bit Bar Salem, Ian Bergeson from The Offseason and 16-Bit Heroes, alongside his wife Katie Kreisel and his son Felix, David Gilson from another retro gaming podcast, Foxes in the Hen House, James Rolfe and Mike Matei from Cinemassacre, Matt Michael and Sarah Rostone from Frank, California, as ever, Jules Carrozza from Gen Y Films, and finally the Boston Open Screen Group, Healy Van Voorhees. Arabian and Natwood. 
With these out of our skulls, onto the game's main overview. It's another cliche ass medieval fantasy tale within which the Dark Lady Manix has single handedly taken over the main kingdom. Why there's no name for it, God only knows. Its fate now rests in the hands of three fearless freedom fighters, all in service of their one and only master, namely the Barbarian, the Huntress, and the Wizard, to overcome all the dark hearted, bloodthirsty, and incessant forces of Manax, and eventually have their wise spiritual leader reclaim his powers to quote unquote restore order and goodness to the land, and then maybe some. As far as gameplay, it's a medieval themed action adventure platformer akin to the likes of Taito's Kadash and Rastan, in which you take control of one or two of the three willing combatants, guiding them from one area of the ravaged realm to another, not to mention wiping out each demonic and dark hearted creature, being an entity, and racking up a piss ton of extra items in tandem with silver, this game's currency for the record, and a mandatory asset for the acquisition of more feasible items, most notably armor for much improved defense and assailing efficiency. There are eight stations in total, divided into three separate areas, with the final revolving around a crucial boss confrontation no less. Taking place from the barren fire and brimstone landscapes, mountainsides, catacombs, forests, and various strongholds leading up to the castle of Manix herself. As expected, your desired characters each have physical attributes that set themselves apart from each other, not just their looks of course. The Huntress, while turning out to be the most agile and deer-like, jump-wise and speed-wise, harnesses somewhat standard attack capabilities. The Barbarian, while standard in terms of speed and jumping capabilities, if maybe extremely degraded, harnesses a much greater attack prowess, whereas the Wizard sports weak yet competent long-range projectile magic and slightly improved jumping capabilities than the Barbarian. They can, however, enhance their attributes by acquiring the aforementioned armor for themselves later, which, as expensive as it is, is mandatory for the latter half of the game. Bottom line, collect and save as much silver as possible in between each level. Control-wise, your run-of-the-mill D-pad migrates your character at will, in tandem with ducking by the traditional down, also effective for blocking enemy attacks, which, and this is also a huge must, is important for even the most extreme encounters. Therefore, consider yourself fucked if you don't learn this technique early on, as well as swapping items around in the inventory menu, accessed by pausing via start, whereas A, B, and C allow him or her to use any item from said inventory menu, attack and jump individually. Also, here's yet another tip to keep in mind. In the true fashion of the infamous Bubsy by Accolade, while paused, you can actually get a quick, suitably ranged view of what lies ahead by holding down C in conjunction with the D-pad. Your character's life force is in the form of a squiggly tube, and whenever he or she gets hit and or exposed to any hazard, the red area will decrease by the lump, and when it empties, it's your ass, pure, plain, and simple. In addition to potions used for emergency life refills, acquired from treasure chests along with silver and even from vanquished foes, you can also use golden forest field serums, silver invisibility serums, as well as white anti-gas potions for temporary protection, not to mention blast arrows, strength scrolls, Midas coins, and accompanying magic stars for much painless obliterations, all of which, like it's not obvious already, must be used in decisive moderation. Anyways, getting to the enemy troop, they consist of multicolored zombie skeletons, bats, spiders, some of which can be mistakenly found in what I like to call credulously isolated surprise treasure chests, flame covered imps, red and gray club wielding orcs, axe wielding werewolves, broadsword wielding dwarves, Peter Dinklage, meet your new roommates, ruthless knights, hooded half lizards, dagger wielding griffin warriors, falcon men, gargoyles, seriously, even most of Death Adders and Dark Gold's armies from the Golden Axe franchise and Astaroth's never ending legion of demons from Ghosts and Goblins are total pussies compared to what we're looking at here. Granted, while some of them are in push over prairie, others will make you their grass in a suka in 2.3 seconds, shit if in less time. And let's not even get ourselves started with the end boss confrontations either, occurring within the third area of your current stage, I might add. Sonic anyone? A flaming demon spawn that summons those very same imps, a teleporting wizard whose tricks and incantations rival those of Ganon and Raiden combined, a gigantic Medusa head in stages 3 and 5, a two form dagger wielding lizard warrior, a stone launching mutant falcon, a gargantuan green demonic rock head with a saw blade emanating from its cake hole, amongst other environmental offenses, and finally, Manax herself, in the form of a fucking two headed dragon no less. Kinkidor, meet your new goddamn concubine. On the latter cast, with proper timing, patience, and tact, you'll eventually snuff those unrelenting piss and sons of bitches. But keep in mind, even so much as getting to those jackasses is far from a goddamn motherfucking cinch, and that, along with other controversies upon which I propose to touch base, is where the traditional upcoming move point comes into play. As somewhat sluggish and a tad derelict as the controls can be at appropriate intervals, mostly in terms of the jump timing and determining the right opportunities for counteroffensive strategies, they're fundamental at best considering how much time they can take to get used to regardless of which character you've selected from the get-go. Regarding the challenge in a nutshell, while it's evident that Blades of Vengeance offers all that there is limitless trials of wits and wisdom a cordial fucking invitation, and in comparison to every other super hard title I've covered in the past that dare not speak their names, hence my intended alias of course, this game's overall difficulty will rise up more swiftly than one might fathom, in fact much more so than both the Moon and Sun combined, thus arbitrarily tempting you to douse your controller in kerosene and senselessly ignite the shit out of it like it's no one's godforsaken beeswax. 
Seriously, I wouldn't expect much of a cakewalk here as it won't be around long enough to wipe your ass or even at the very least tend to your severe physical and mental wounds. For instance, crews with the previously established control issues and the patients in pride testing, intellect shaming environmental threats. Enemy confrontation tact is a huge must in my book. Remember that crouch blocking technique I hinted at earlier? It's no wonder that every relentless foe you oppose, including the aforestated end bosses no less, will straight up cut your ass down like a pile of scraps being exposed to a paper shredder. Same spiel with those aforementioned environmental threats. For example, the arcs of flame, falling rocks, and those cliche ass booby traps including spikes, extending needles, buzz saws, you name it. Even some set off by an unsuspecting ground button, I might add. Shit, even if you think you're on the right track, more adversaries will emerge out of thin air with barely any indication whatsoever, which is why I firmly advocate, without any reservation, preparing for the absolute worst. And the less I comment about the infamous fall damage due to massive height leaps, the better. I mean, come on, man! Tomb Raider, Blaster Master, Lesser the Unlikely and Legacy of the Wizard much? Trial and error, folks. That's our lesson here. Trial and fucking error. And before I forget, there are no passwords or save files here. Oh, fuck no. Starting out with only two lives, more of which can also be purchased in between stages depending on how much silver you've accrued or conserved, and here's yet another time bomb waiting to set itself the hell off. Absolutely no continues, except once instantly awarded to you upon scoring every 75,000 points, which for the record, can take up until the third, maybe the fourth stages, hence the fanfare. However, upon using one of them up, your special items are diminished, with the obvious exception of your healing potions, of course. I'd bear in mind the advisory I've indicated throughout regarding all the tumultuous, severe horseshit many have endured and will endure if I were you, as they'll resonate with you between each potential attempt. Therefore, I'm setting in stone two bottom lines A, my aforementioned three word mantra trial and error, and B, don't get dramatically crestfallen, no matter what. Outdated as the graphics are, they're nothing short of captivating. From all the central medieval themed settings, all the way to their supporting populations of demonic and dark hearted foes that stalk them. Hell, the main trio of Crusaders aren't too shabby either, detail wise and animation wise, including the ever so seductive Huntress, whom I'm ranking as one of my official all time video game hotties, putting even the likes of Tyrus Flare, Sonya Blade, Cami White, and even the Dark Queen from Battletoads to absolute shame, both in their neutral forms and with armor equipped alike. The interiors and exteriors, notwithstanding their redundant design and construction methods, are far from an impetuous atrocity, complete with ethereal visuals and special effects that accompany the mood in more ways than one, thereby serving nothing less than a homage to fantasy lore of yesteryear. Aside from the pre-stage cutscenes with their wise master, rife with his own supporting dialogue, no less. Another feature worth noting is the addition of blood and gore whenever the main protagonists and or a fair selection of their opposing adversaries get exposed to any damage from weapons, judging from Sega's MA13 rating at the time via their ill-fated video game rating console guidelines. Shit, Mortal Kombat, anyone? Ah! Predating the establishment of the ESRB, or the Entertainment Software Rating Board, by a year. Honestly, must they go on any goddamn further? Regarding the music and sound, arranged and orchestrated by the dynamic duo of Marshall Parker and Ian Eccles Smith, while the overall selection of tracks isn't what many would expect from a brutal as shit fantasy themed hack and slash action platformer, it's at least serviceable and do much more than work magnificently with the visuals. Sure, the first stage theme is a goddamn shining example of the former indicated issue, considering how repetitive it can become after a while, and the brooding tension it lacks, unlike the later areas which amass much better quality, but it's about as addictive as Super Red Espresso Snowflake and Northern Lights meshed into one. The sound effects are also serviceable due to the current actions of every main character, for example weapon swings, death explosions, what have us. Not counting the aforementioned first stage theme, take note of my top 5 tracks shown here. Replayability wise, in addition to both the key differences the three main characters share in terms of their main attributes as well as the shopping procedure in between stages and the silver currency system, the differentiating links of the 8 stages through which they traverse, not to mention the chaotic occurrences that take place within, all of which A will definitely make you keep returning for more like no fucking other, and B I strongly advocate referring back for the sake of preventing myself from shifting into broken record mode, Blades of Vengeance is, without the midnight fucking shadow of a doubt, worth mastering and eventually conquering time and time again, notwithstanding its legendary difficulty level, rivaling even those of Target Earth, Shikam the Forever Man, Gyrez, Musha, Metallic Uniframe Super Hybrid Armor, Comic Zone, and other Genesis hair pullers of the era. All in all, I for one don't foresee any impetus to turn down this unbelievably intense, havoc filled medieval fantasy hack and slash adventure. Therefore, what's my final verdict on yet another hidden gem such as this? Words cannot express how highly I recommend the hell out of yet another obscure but nerve wracking medieval themed game. Every aspect I've highlighted so far should be all the more reason to get out there and track down Blades of Vengeance, and yes, most of its obvious cons I've also established, if there are any, are far outweighed by their pros, and then some. 
Seriously, I give that God of War horseshit a rest and switch to this medieval motherfucker by any means necessary. Trust me, it'll make even Dark Souls look like Zelda Sun any day. Until then, many thanks for watching and sticking by yours truly throughout the last grueling year, and be sure to keep a close, careful lookout for my Season 5 premiere ensuing this fall. With all that set in stone, this is the Hardcore Retro God proudly signing off.